what's good it's your girl jasmine back with another video on the channel yes ma'am yes sir so today i'm doing a highly requested video um uh, we got a long one today i don't know if i'm gonna break this up into multiple videos i'm just gonna put it out on one video i don't know we shall see but either way i hope you are tuning in and you are watching with me and um i never seen this at all never even heard about it um but i'm excited because you all give me great suggestions and I'm glad to finally be able to get to it. Uh, so with that being said, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, notification bell. Share this video with your friends and family so others can come on over and enjoy their fun too. And I want y'all in the comments section because I need y'all I need y'all here with me on this one. I really do. With that being said, we got the NBA Dream Team 92. Let's get it. Dream matchups. Dream opportunities. <clears throat> you do it because so much of sports <clears throat> is about imagining what you want things to be like. If only the setting were just right. It was one of those times none of us will ever forget. The characters, just right. I don't know anything about Angola, but Angola's in trouble. The timing, just right. 11 Hall of Famers. I don't think you can ever do that again at no point in time. If only it could all be. Eleven. That's crazy, because I'm trying to think about the other... Um, um, I'm trying to think about the other Olympian teams, basketball teams, and... Phew. The way you might have dreamed it up yourself. Oh, are you filming? Yep. That's the most exhilarating 15 seconds of my life. People perceived us as being superheroes. Please like us, you're dead! No, Isaiah Thomas. No, Isaiah Thomas question. Cool. Ha! <laughs> he said no, I did question. Isaiah Thomas. This never happened in sports. Nowhere. Well, I figured eventually there'd be a movie made about the Dream Team. This group may well be the greatest team ever assembled the history of team sports let's get it god bless you and god bless america 20 years can go by pretty fast and the world isn't gonna stop and wait for you to remember what it used to look like 1992 was a time of change new faces in america quickly transforming into cultural icons none more so than the superstars of the nba the Bulls have repeated when the party now i'm gonna try my best not to do too much talking but y'all know how i get y'all know i ask questions y'all know i like interacting with y'all so like i said this video is gonna be long um but anyway um which era do you think was the best era? Because they said 92, you know, there was a time for change and, you know, all this stuff, new faces. Ooh, ooh. Which era you think has been the best era of your lifetime? Let me know. After the legends of the ages, oh, look at me. The got the Indiana State on. Come on, bird. Come on, bird. I got you, brother. A fresh crop of players have blown the lid off. Okay, Barkley. Hey, David Robinson is very underrated player. Them more than just basketball players. I am not a role model. They were a new kind of star athlete whose popularity transcended the game. Is it the shoes? No, Mom. And now the very best of them awaited their brightest showcase, the world's largest athletic stage the Olympic Games in Barcelona, Spain, even if no one truly realized the impact they would make there. Look at their hats. <laughs> it's a watershed moment in the history of sports, not just not just the Olympics, not just basketball. Um, it, it, it moved the culture along. But in 1992, not everyone was ready for them. Not everyone thought pro basketball stars had a place in the Olympics. This kind of thing had never, ever, ever been done. What you mean? I don't so, understand that. What you mean they think that 
pro basketball players didn't have a place. Because I know, I know that they had college, you know, players at first, right? So did all the other teams not have pros, athletes? Was the basketball, was the NBA the first to ever do that? It was a lot of, you know, poking. <coughs> Excuse me, y'all, sorry. I'm by kidding. people in my profession. Sports journalists and journalists in general were skeptical, angry, you know, because this wasn't the Olympic movement. The Olympic ideal had always been about amateur competition, mm. which meant the United States had always sent basketball teams made up of college kids. Gotcha. Teams that dominated for decades. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. In 1972, the Soviet Union was awarded a victory over the U.S. in a controversial gold medal game. The United States apparently had won the game, but the debate still goes on. To this day, that American team still hasn't claimed their silver medals. Oh, for real? But that result seemed like a fluke when the Americans got the gold in their next two Olympic appearances. The U.S. has its ninth gold medal. While the U.S. celebrated, though, the rest of the world was catching up. So in 1988, when the Soviets won again, there was no talk of any fluke. The United States goes home with a semi-final loss to the bigger, more experienced USSR team. Who was on that team? I was embarrassed. Anybody? I know some of the guys left know? their medals there in the room. They didn't want to take them home. And here we are, um, USA on our chest, and we didn't get the job done. But the amateur ideal had gotten muddled. While NBA players were prohibited from Olympic competition, professionals from other leagues abroad could play. If you played in Europe for money, you were an amateur, but if you played in the NBA for money, you were a professional. What? And so our players weren't eligible. That's crazy. Why they do that? Because they knew the talent we had, right? Is that why? Or was it really just like, that's crazy. That's mind blowing, actually. Eligible. Those other countries were using pros. Playing against 18, 19 year old kids. That is really unfair. Right. Changing the hypocrisy, though, was a central goal of a European named Boris Stankovic, the head of FIBA, the World Basketball Federation. He was very much intent on lifting basketball up to the highest possible level of international sports. And if the whole world knew that the very best players in the world were not participating in the Olympics, that made it a second class event. So in 1989, Stankovic issued a resolution to allow pros from all leagues to compete in the Olympics. But back in America, the NBA was lukewarm to the idea. We wanted to be good partners with FIBA to grow the sport of basketball, but we weren't particularly anxious. We didn't know what it would mean. We didn't know if our players would want to do it. We didn't know what the logistics were, but the vote passed and NBA players were eligible for the Olympics. Now the issue wasn't about whether American pros could play, but whether the best players wanted to play. The one guy that, you know, that... That we were a little concerned about was probably Michael. The thought back then was Michael Jordan plays 36 holes of golf. 90 days during the summer. What the hell is he going to be doing playing basketball? <laughs> I was hoping they would not ask me to participate. And uh, I was trying to figure out a way graciously that I could decline. I'd done the Olympic thing before, and when Rod Thorne called me and asked me, I wasn't gun ho about it. My appeal to him was... That's crazy. And that's kind of sad because it's like... Most people will be like, hell yeah, I want to play for the Olympics. You know, it's something, you know, nice to add to my resume. But I guess, like he said, like, I've done it before. We lost. I've done it. We won. It ain't nothing, you know, for me left to do. It probably, I wonder if it wasn't fun because mm -hmm, he ain't had the nobody on that player in the world. Actually, he this did. This is bigger yeah, than Rocks, the NBA man. Finals. And, you know, we need you. His thing, well, who else is playing? Right. I mean, are all the good players going to play? You know, I'm not going to play by myself. Right. So Michael Jordan ain't wasted my summer. And Rod Thorne made his next call. 
it was a no-brainer for me. <laughs> you know, I was in from day one. And I figured if I jumped in first and said I wanted to play, that would get guys to want to participate as well. I think if Magic wasn't on that team, I don't think it would have been as spectacular as it was. And uh, Birds in the house. Players, that was important for both of us. Once you get guys like Magic and Larry committing to the team, then all of a sudden it's easy it for everybody something else. Something very, very special. Right. Uh, representing the USA is already a, a tremendous honor, but to know that you're going to be on a dream team <laughs> is a once in a lifetime experience. <laughs> Magic, Bird, and David Robinson weren't alone in their pride. They called in the big guns. <clears throat> We're the Navy SEALs that we had to go over there and kick butt and take names. With those stars and the Utah Jazz tandem of John Stockton and Carl Malone, the dream team was starting to take shape. It don't matter. Yo, this may be a silly question, but do they get paid? Did they get paid for that? Or was this more for like, you'll get exposure, like this is what you get in return type thing. And you get to put USA on the map. Like, like I'm probably asking silly questions to some people, but just really questions that comes in my head. So please. Don't talk about me in the comments. If you call me last, I got the call. I didn't feel like that I deserved to be called. Mm. Uh, I truly uh, wasn't going to tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah. I'm Chris. Like, I didn't even think to say who was on the team. I, that was it. I'm like, yeah, I'm good. Yes. That's Charles Barkley's ability was never in question, but his attitude was. God, he's shaving. He to win the world championship. <laughs> I don't know if I go that far, Charles. No, no, but I talked to him the other night. I learned early in Philadelphia. It doesn't matter what I say. So from this day forward, I'm gonna say what the hell I want to say. Ooh. And some people gonna like it, and some people gonna dislike okay. it. Okay. But after a series of incidents Talk on ish. and off the court, the least of the committee's concerns were about what Barkley would say. <coughs> I was asked to talk to him. He was so honored that we would even think about asking him. He convinced me that uh, you won't have any problems with me. <laughs> now, with the team nearly complete, Rod Thorne had enough talent secured to go back to where he started. Representing my country was a big thing, but I think you know the biggest motivation for me was now I get to spend time with some of the guys I compete against all the time. True, true. Portland's Clyde Drexler rounded out the list of NBA players, while the final spot on the roster was reserved for an amateur, oh. Duke's Christian Leitner, coming off back-to-back -back NCAA titles. There's the pass to Leitner. Puts it up. Hey, I bet that was In crazy, boy. Leitner might have been the team's crazy. best star, but on this team, he was fine with being the last guy on the bench. I tell That's people a bad this all the time, lose. and it may shock them, but my most enjoyable year was my freshman year because they don't expect nothing from you except carry the luggage, do the laundry, and, and get our donuts. And that's easy. <laughs> the harder thing is to be the leader. By May of 1991, two months before the... Look at that lineup. Look at that lineup, boy. Hold on, let's see. One, two, three, four. Dang, Leitner's a Hall of Famer? <sighs> Look at that's crazy. Who would have thought? The Olympics, mm -hmm. the team was set. One college kid and 11 future Hall of Famers. The man charged with putting it all together was the unflappable Chuck Daly. Okay, all set. All set. Chuck looked the part. He was the guy that looked like he owned the arena, but he would also push the broom. Ta. Okay. His hair was beautiful. His suits were immaculate. He wanted to win, but he wanted to look good. Okay, period. As the head coach of the Detroit Pistons, Daly did both, winning back-to-back -back championships in 1989 and 90. The Pistons are winners and still champions of the world. The Pistons were nicknamed the Bad Boys for their aggressive and some said dirty style of play. Never more evident than in their memorable playoff battles with Michael Jordan's Bulls. 
Michael on the move against Vinny Johnson to the move. He is necktied. Oh. Michael Jordan goes down hard. Detroit and Chicago. Ah, no he was like, we ain't at the park, so man. Daly was named like Detroit team coach. Many wondered how he'd handle working with the Bulls' biggest star. I was being asked to <laughs> wrestle with some demons and some, some issues. But the coach was well acquainted with the task of managing personalities. He coached the bad boys. And if you can coach those you can coach anybody. No, Charles. Charles is well. One wouldn't be coaching in the Olympics, Talking however, like it. was his own star in Detroit. Point guard Isaiah Thomas, who controversially had been left off the team's roster. No matter how much people try to say now, you know, it was no big a deal. Uh, it was a big deal. Yeah, uh, I because I... Isaiah Thomas, he was nice. He was nice. And you and I feel like that was like the prime Isaiah Thomas during that time. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, but you picking who you picking? You picking John Magic? Or you picking Isaiah Thomas and John or Isaiah and Magic? You know what I'm saying? Like who are you really picking? If you had to make the decision, that's tough. That's really tough. Oh, I forgot about Clyde, but was he a point guard or shooting guard? Isaiah, at the beginning of the year, uh, about the aspect he wasn't on the team, and uh, he was not comfortable with it. Uh, I'm sure he is very hurt. He's a very deserving player. But, uh, you know, he was not selected. Thomas was well on his way to a Hall of Fame career, but was also seen by many as the biggest cultivator of the bad boy's image in Detroit. And now Isaiah Thomas and Uh oh. Isaiah was the general. Dang. He was the guy that would yap at his teammates and say, knock him on the ass, do whatever you got to do. Hey, I just look at that as a hard foul, man. You know what I'm saying? If I'm foul, you're a foul. His haircut was weak, though. <laughs> hey, don't do my guy bird that game. No, I did not want him on the team. Did Michael, did you want him on the team? Well, I can't speak for Michael, but... uh. I don't think he won them on the team. <laughs> I ain't even think now, about that. Speculation. That, that I ain't even think about that problem. Dang. That probably would have been a little that either would have went really good, because they'd be like, oh, he ain't too bad. Or knowing MJ and Scotty, they would have been like, nah, we not playing with him. We not doing that. Mm. Your icy relationship with Isaiah Thomas is the reason that he was not selected. Well, what is your reaction to that? That was one of the stipulations put to me prior to me even committing that uh, Isaiah wasn't a part of the team. I was getting strong innuendos that it wasn't just, you know, it was coming from higher places that didn't want Isaiah Thomas on the team. Certain things are being pointed at me because of our relationship and, uh, and of course, about the, the way that the, the end of the game between Detroit and Chicago uh, ended. We were picking the group just after the Pistons had been eliminated by the Bulls, and it was a very bad timing uh, for Isaiah. Everybody had fresh in their mind the picture of Isaiah walking off the court. Pistons wasting no time and getting out of here. They left the bench on the 7 and 9, 10 seconds remaining. Dang. When the Pistons walked off the court, before the final bell. I, I think it left a bad taste in a lot of people's uh, mouths. That's crazy. All right, no Isaiah Qu Thomas questions. No Isaiah stuff. Thomas questions. Cool. Jordan and the team were done answering questions about Isaiah. But with training camp approaching, a bigger question would need to be answered. Hello, how you doing? How would the 12 stars that were selected play together? Training camp began on June 22nd, 1992, in La Jolla, California. And when the gym doors opened, no one was quite sure what to expect, especially the players themselves. It's a lot of egos in one gym and on one team. Everybody wanted their form to shine and showcase why they were a part of this team. With all these stars on the team, if it comes down to the last shot, who's going to take the shot? Me. Me. Everybody in the world has an ego. <laughs> the only difference between us, we have a reason to have an ego. <laughs> Struggling to write anything? You and every other professional. That's a difference between 
the players back then and today's players. The players today want to team up with them, man. They don't want to play against them. They want to team up with them. Back then, they was on the same team. And in practice, they was like, man, forget that. I don't want to be on his on his five, on his squad. I don't want to play against this dude, man. That's how it's supposed to be. Like a lot of, um, I think it's good that they do that because at the end of the day, the team with the most talent got the most to lose. The team without the most talent don't got they ain't got they ain't got nothing to lose. The team with the most talent got the most to lose. That people are eyes all on them, you know what I'm saying? They're, it's a lot. People are not looking at the people with not that much talent. So of course the selected team was very um, calm, cool, collected. And they was like, oh, this you know only way they should have been nervous is because they like against who they're playing. But once they got out there, I'm sure they was like, oh yeah. Oh, yeah, come on, let's go. You feel me? Because they got more to prove, you know? Um, especially the, uh, I can't remember what year it was, maybe 04, maybe. I can't remember for sure. But they had to get a wake-up call, too, because it was like, come on, bro. Yeah, you got you got Chris Paul, you got Carmelo, you got all these people on her, but. Mm. Two Olympics, they had to qualify. The place to do that was Portland, Oregon, and the Tournament of the Americas. It would be the public's first chance to see the NBA stars together in a game, especially Jordan, Bird, and Magic. Daly had asked all three to be team captains, but Jordan had turned him down. Right there, right there, right there. Let alone right there. That is... That's a lot on its own right there. Like That's a beast right there on its own. That's crazy. That's crazy. I knew how much it meant to both of those guys because they never had the opportunity to play on the Olympics. So I'd say, you know what, Chuck, don't worry about me. You know, let these old dogs do it. Walmart makes holiday cooking a breeze for me because I won't have to pay any more this year than I did. <coughs> Magic and Bird weren't just the team's oldest players. They were also the most revered. They had entered the league together in 1979, embarking on a rivalry that had redefined the NBA. And along the way, their personal admiration for one another had grown. Maddie's just a great basketball player. He's the best I've ever seen, you know. I... Unbelievable. I don't know what to say. In 1992, they'd be getting the chance to share the ball. But the opportunity would be coming at the end of their careers. Bird had given his soul to the game. Mm. But after so many years, his body was betraying him. Had back problems. It just gets to the point where you just couldn't play. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't think, couldn't move, uh, couldn't run. You know, if you can't feel your feet, it's hard to run. Dang. Larry was on the fence because of his back, so I said, "Man, LB, you gotta play, man. You gotta play. This is our last chance to be together." Magic would be able to convince his well, old you friend can't to play. Feel your feet because but at the start of the 1991-92 NBA <laughs> season, he was forced to retire after learning he had the HIV virus. Doctors would eventually clear him to play in the Olympics, though that didn't stop fears from swirling. There's a lot of players that really didn't want him to play, didn't want to play with him or against him because nobody knew what disease meant. You know, they say you get a little blood on you, you got HIV breeze on you you know uh, I never bought any of that you know I just you just keep going and that's what Irvin decided to do just keep pushing keep going Six, five, three, four, five. they was real deal best friends like you can truly sit here and say they was real deal best friends which is love like you gotta be excited to see stuff like that because that's dope they was real dope best friends. Magic had like, made a he's like, that's my dog. <laughs> in the 1992 All-Star Game and had focused his attention on the Olympics, hoping for an encore of a lifetime alongside his old rival. Our careers were really over, and it was something I thought needed to happen for both of us. Their debut would take place at Portland's Rose Garden with their team needing to medal <laughs> he's like, my the boy. of the Americas to qualify for the Olympics. That seemed like a foregone conclusion to just about everyone, including their first opponents, who were completely in awe before the game even started. The Cuban team spontaneously like drops to its knees as if 
12 popes had come by on Easter Sunday. At that point, the idea that this is merely a basketball game has been ripped asunder. It was a surreal feeling. She's like, dude, we, we're here to kick y'all behind. And they want to take pictures with you. <laughs> And then the game begins. Nah, that's a wild, though. Out. That's a wild. Like, we here to play against y'all. Y'all over here taking pictures. Like, but I get it, though, because it's like, yo, y'all got MJ. Y'all got Magic. Y'all got Larry. Y'all got Clyde. Y'all got David. Y'all got John. Y'all got Carl. You know what I'm saying? And so on. And it's like, we ain't going to never see all these players on the same team ever again. I would want to snap a pick, too. And I'm playing against you? That's crazy. <clears throat> Together, two guys that had saved the league. They wouldn't even be playing this game without those two. And Magic passed the ball. Larry makes the first basket. Banking in, goes to the fadeaway. I mean, you know, it just, it just didn't get any better than that. The U.S. was off and running, and the result was a thing of beauty. Johnson leading the break. And no one seemed more excited to be sharing the court than the co-captains. Opening night was a smashing success, but the outcome never in doubt. Woo! Woo! And later that fast game, was tough. Fans in Portland decided they wanted a curtain call from a three-time MVP. The crowd started cheering. Larry. Larry, Larry. Look how excited he was. You feel me? Look at him. Larry's like, I'm too old for this, man. I'm trying to get up out. I'm just trying to chill. And Matt is like, boy, if you don't get up enough. But that's cute. That's cute. That's a good friendship right there. Big Bird. Big Bird. Larry Bird rose to the occasion. It was a virtually flawless performance. The final margin of victory was 77 points. And Magic the other team and had led the way. For Magic in particular, after a year out of the game, the victory had a special kind of meaning. Living with HIV, never even thinking that I would ever have a chance to play basketball again, and then basketball for uh, the United States. It was therapy for me, and I needed that in the worst way and then there was the matter of making sure michael jordan knew he was back as well yeah you hear what the captain said the captain said sit down, sit down. Well, this boat is gonna sink. that's right have a seat because you're gonna fall and the captain, that's, the captain, that's, the captain, that's, that's the seniority right there. i know it sit with magic <laughs> yeah he says sit up <laughs> there was that little extra something <laughs> there you know <laughs> and the, something kind of to prove to each other i took it upon myself to always shoot with michael okay mj free throws today who was the first one to 50. or we had little games who, who was the better shooter He didn't want to relinquish that control of the 80s, in a sense, even though we were going into the 90s. Don't touch the phone. One hand, don't touch it. You know what's funny to me is, like, you really do get that, like, you can tell who played in what era or who's from what era because, like, just how Magic talking, he's talking just like an OG. And, like, he gives this, like, the, the 70s and 80s era. Like, he just gives that. Which is why I asked y'all, like, which era was the best era? He just gives, like, 70s and 80s. And MJ just gives 90s. Like, he just gives it. <laughs> You know, he just come off missing a whole year. So it was who can win, who's gonna have the bragging rights by the end of this trip. 
can't get too close to Michael, it's a foul. <laughs> you haven't committed a foul in almost a year and a half, man. How can you talk? <laughs> Michael's always tried he's to make cracking up. Know that he's a top dog in, in whatever. That's just his competitive mode. I'm the young guy with the old, uh, elder <laughs> statesman. These old guys, they got off the rise. They can't stand in one spot too long. <laughs> he's a young puppy. I'm the big dog here. Whatever I say goes. While the winner of Magic and Michaels, Can You Top This Challenge, remained in doubt, when it came to facing the competition in the Tournament of the Americas, the team stood united. When we took the court in Portland, which, you know, we're on home ground, we wanted to showcase to the fans who would be representing them. The Ooh, is come on. I'm going to send a message around the world today that y'all can give it up. You foreigners can give it up. <laughs> Charles is be talking, boy. The Americans won their six games at the tournament by an average of 50 points. All right, Larry, um, your impressions of tonight's game. <laughs> the gold medal was no surprise. But what was unexpected was the team's interactions with their opponents. We showered them with adulation before. Yo, look at his haircut. That was and crazy. Even games. Patrick Johnson and Aranga shaking. Nah, that's wow. That is like what? Like I understand, like you playing against somebody that you looked up to that you probably never expected to play against, but you in the middle of a game about to shoot a free throw and you shaking Magic's hand like y'all on the street like you know what i'm saying like that's wow like i wonder how they felt like the usa team felt like as like because to me like were they cocky because you know how they was getting treated you would think like they would be super arrogant but y'all gotta tell me the tournament of the americas had served its purpose the u.s had qualified for the barcelona games and given the world its first glimpse of what was coming later that summer. I just want to say this is just a small step of what our goal really is to get to Barcelona, win the gold medal, and bring it back where it's supposed to be. Thank you. You heard me. I've never seen Larry with a kid. With the Barcelona Olympics a week away, I always ask the U.S. Y'all men's kids. basketball team headed overseas. Look, he, that's the one that dates Scotty Pippen, ex-wife. <laughs> they would hold several days of practice in Monte Carlo and play one more tune-up before heading to the Olympics. The luxurious setting on the Mediterranean Sea was fitting for what already may have been the world's most famous team. Monte Carlo is one of those glamorous cities, and here we were with the most glamorous team ever so it's kind of a rock star yeah i think this team was it was more famous than kobe lebron all them let me know people have their own opinions so don't get mad if they think you know such and such team was this and such a team was that you know but i feel like this this type of lineup this type of squad right here you're not going to touch that ever again. Like, that's wow. That's wow. It's a wild team right there. <laughs> the players were relaxed and confident <clears throat> and willing to admit there was more to the trip than just basketball. I don't worry about playing basketball. That comes natural. I just want to have fun. David Robinson, Pat, you and Michael Jordan, this is like spring break in the ghetto. <laughs> Charles is wild, boy. Was a playground waiting to I didn't know explore. Charles is that wild. And the players weren't shy about enjoying themselves. As they shouldn't be. Are y'all feeling me? Now look, the scene in Monte Carlo was great. It was just breathtaking. I was down on the beach just kind of trying to enjoy some of the scenery. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's in the scenery. I think every team in the NBA should train here, actually. <laughs> they need to get a team here. Chris and talks like that? What the, the heck? We made a beeline to the swimming pool. Cause all those girls will land out topless. I'm gonna be in that pool so much <laughs> in the next two days. I think I'm on the swimming team in Barcelona. We're all Ooh. out there with our significant others, and 
all these women walking around the topless coming, can I have an autograph? <laughs> so I signed it, and Michael Pops been telling us, see, usually you tell everybody no, but because this, this lady coming over topless, you're gonna hey. find an autograph. Hey, I it. just know they was acting up. Fool, do you hear me? A uh, fool. But as they should, I'm glad they took it as this is ain't gonna happen again. We gonna show our ass. Like this is not about to ever happen again. And I'm glad they took it like that. Cause I was gonna ask y'all if they like really, really took in what they was doing to a, like in the world. That's crazy. <laughs> I bet they got stories that's not even on her that they talk about the still to this day. You know, seven dollars beer. I never heard of that. Of course, Patrick didn't drink. He didn't know how much beer was. One thing you don't want to do is drink beer with Larry Bird. And Larry Bird drinks Budweiser, which <laughs> Budweiser is the strongest beer in the world. <laughs> and my head hurt for like two days. <laughs> they were used to being opponents, but Monte Carlo was proving to be the perfect place to find common ground. I got the coach. That means we get to go first. Michael Jordan. Enjoys his golf. Right about uh, say MJ he boy, he loved off. golfing. I got the coaching. I got caught blunt. You know what I mean? I'm surprised he didn't try to be a golfer too. Played almost every single day, if not every day. Come off the hill. That may be green, Chuck. Chuck was playing his practice schedule around our golf time. That's that crazy. Deal. That's crazy. Play a little bit of basketball, play a little golf, and you're in Monte Carlo. Yeah, it sounds like a basketball. The relationship that a head coach has with his main guy is incredibly important. Chuck's ability to get Michael is amazing because think of how bitter enemies they had to be. Chuck devised the defense mm. that drove Jordan out of his mind. Mm. And that is true. I didn't even think about that. Like, like, you know how good of a person you have to be? Like... MJ could not stand your team, and I'm sure you couldn't stand the Bulls, right? But you create this bond, this relationship. You put all that to the side. That's crazy. That's tough. A lot of people's egos too big to do that. Yet, yeah, here they are playing golf together. Jordan could really have unbelievably bad feelings towards Chuck. Chuck understood that, and he embraced them. Chuck, yeah. That was a bonding thing for me and Chuck. Always been a thing that I treasure just as much as being a part of the team. For Jordan, <laughs> golf was only one part of the whirlwind schedule, which his teammates were discovering was just the way he liked it. What are you doing today, I'm You want to speak? I remember thinking that. Does this guy ever sleep? <laughs> Golf, 36 holes. I'm playing it tomorrow, too. He would do more things and be ready to practice and play as much as anybody. Nah, somebody did tell me Jordan's like. Most was going out and playing golf with Michael Jordan. Like he game. never and truly. I thought, I'm rested. gonna be exhausted tonight. And Michael just had ridiculous energy and was phenomenal. They said he drank crazy like amount of beer before a game, gamble, so, golf. Know, gave me a whole level they said he did everything but the freak rested. Of nature that he really is. And, and then go out and drop like 40. We played cards and in Magic Room to it's 5 o'clock in the morning pretty much every night. It was so much fun. Is that right, homie? Yeah, I'm tired. He's like a bionic guy or he'd play cards. Play golf, play basketball. Jordan, all the way. I don't know when he ever slept. <laughs> Finally, after a ball game, he was just lying down. And I looked at him. He got the Olympic like, Sevens, though. That's the first time he's gone to sleep on the whole trip. So was MJ a true freak of nature? Like he was really one of those ones where you're like, I can only imagine how like, just like his teammates and stuff probably be like, bro, how the heck do you do this? You know, cause it's like, dang. And I'm sure if I had like one day or one game seeing MJ live, I probably would have the same mindset as some of you all saying that he's the GOAT or like, you know, fans saying like he's the best ever like nobody's ever gonna do what he do 
I just wish I had that one time, that one time. Monte Carlo was kind of a turning point. Nah, but be for real. Just imagine all of them playing together in their prime. Woo-wee! Because this is the end of MJ and Larry's career. Uh, MJ, I'm saying like Magic Johnson. Larry's career. But to have all them in their prime, baby, my NBA wouldn't have been fair. Walls started to come down from, you know, when you're playing against each other, you have these rivalries. These are my teammates now. They're guys that, you know, that I'm looking towards for support. It seemed like we became more friends than anything else. The players were off to Barcelona. Just how many the months they spend together? Unmistakably as a team. They the family to travel with them. Team landed in Barcelona for the Olympics on July 24th, 1992. In store was an experience unlike anything they or the sports world had ever seen. The plane landing in Barcelona, helicopters flying over it. We're thinking, wow, what is all the commotion? What happened? And then we figured out they were there for us. He said, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> that was the first time that we realized how popular and how enormous this thing was. I was like, guys, if we lose, it's going to be like the biggest upset in sports history. Literally. Barkley was right. There was no margin for error. A reality the rest of the team openly accepted in their first press conference in Spain. I know I'm really afraid to fail because I can't go back home if, if we don't win the goal. Even though from a little small place in Summerfield, those 250 people there said, we, I can't come back. Barkley, meanwhile, handled an endless barrage of questions as only he could. How did you feel in 1972 when the Soviet Union beat the United States in that wild game? Well, I had just flunked my entrance exam in the kindergarten, so I really, that was the only thing. You know, <laughs> you know, everybody that has ever been in front of a camera, we tend to not say certain things. Why don't they just take their ass whipping like people and go home? <laughs> Barkley says things that we would He's think about. He's wild, say. bro. Try to say anything. Still to this day, he don't care. And, and I Stevie, think that's why people love him so much. Because he's a Christian. But, uh... <laughs> He said, man, you don't talk honestly enough to the media. You need to tell them what you're really thinking. I said, Charles, you talk too much to the media. You need to stop telling them everything you're thinking. And when Charles was asked about the team's first opponent, his prediction was as honest as ever. I don't know anything about Angola, but Angola's in trouble, I think. Just moments ago, the... Y'all think Charles should have got a ring? Y'all think Charles was deserving... I wouldn't say deserving because I feel like he was a good player and I feel like he gets a lot, a lot of backlash because he doesn't have a ring. But if social media was around back then, boy, Charles would have been crazy, crazy. Team team, boy, but the I think he's won that. Hotel, he should have got a ring. The they are heading for their first matchup in Barcelona with the Angolans. I can remember the first game, the real game, when we came out of the locker room and, and stepped on the court. And I finally said to myself, was, I can't believe this. I'm here. At that point, we were in serious Olympic mode. This actually may be the biggest mismatch of the entire Olympics. Mm. Mm. And he was still kind of chubby. Like, ooh. So he was like, he was really getting up there for his size. 46, 46, 46 to 1 run for how oh my great God. the U.S. players were. After the first half, Barkley's pregame prediction appeared dead on. But in the second, Charles found some trouble. Hey, the players in Angola, the play against South Barkley, they told us there's no a, a, a kid, a fat boy, is a is many aggressive in the pain. Rebound, Barkley. Rebound, Barkley. And he's fouled. 
Toughness, come on. I thought they were playing dirty. And, uh, and I told him, <coughs> I, I don't even know if he understood. But I said, hey, man, ease up on the elbow. Hey, man. <laughs> I let it go twice. You can see the frustration with Barkley. And the next time, I just cracked it. No, see, I wish I was born during this time, bro. Two more years and I was born. I wish I was born during this time. I would have love, love, love. If I could think of a bigger word than love right now, I would have love to have seen them play. Like if I would have been this age or a teenager in this time frame, oh man. Heaven. his dying day, Charles claims I feel like highlights don't do justice. Times. I said, Charles, you know, you're full of crap. No, it's not true. I didn't uh, have a battle before the incident. People always say, turn the other cheek. If you turn the other cheek, I'm going to hit you another cheek, too. I thought, what are you doing, Charles? <laughs> the guy is half your size. But you know, Charles was an equal opportunity abuser. Erlanda Codebra did not think it was a, a a friendly elbow. That's the same guy that just asked for an autograph, Charles. I mean, you think he's not intimidated? I think he's acting like a bully, but maybe it's, uh, it's from his personality. The United States has defeated Angola by the score of 116 to 48. The game may have ended in a rout, but afterwards, the result was overshadowed by the controversy. <laughs> well, he hit me, I hit him. That's the way it is. Charles made you look like the ugly Americans, which we were trying not to do. Mm. We said to Charles, look, man, you're a reflection of all of us. So if you do it, they're not going to write the article that Charles Barkley did. They're going to say the dream team. Mm. Barkley had stained a dream debut for the Americans. Somebody said that uh, game, Draymond Green is like a Charles Barkley when it comes to like the attitude and technical fouls and stuff. Is that true? Who do you compare Charles Barkley's style of play to? Let me know. ...against Croatia. Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan grabbed the spotlight <clears throat> with the focus on their matchup with one of Europe's best players, Tony Kukoc. Major Tony Kukoc. The into this game involves Tony Kukoc, second round pick of the Chicago Bulls back in 1989. The Bulls have made a strong push to sign him last season. At that time, general managers in the league were trying to come up with gems, you know, make their discoveries overseas. And Kraus thought this guy could play in the <coughs> NBA. <coughs> While Jordan and Pippen had been winning back to back titles, Chicago GM Jerry Kraus had been publicly wooing Kukoc to join the Bulls. Kraus was recruiting this guy and talking how great he was. You know, that's like a, a father who has all his kids and now he sees another kid that he loves more than he loves his own. Mm. So we were not playing against Tony Kukoc. That's a good way to put we it. We were playing against Jerry Kraus in a Croatian uniform. But unfortunately for the real Tony Kukoc, he was now the target of the world's two best defensive players. He probably like, was tear his who up. was going to guard him. Turn him up. No, no, no. I got it. No, That's no, how no. Kobe did Paul Gasol when they played. Kobe ran straight through that man's Michael chest Scottie first play. And we <laughs> ready for, like, blood. Like, man. We knew the world was going to be watching. We knew everyone wanted to see what Tony Kukoc was like. And we were going to give him the worst experience. MJ's like, I'm not he playing. Turn him up. <laughs> Pippen drew the initial assignment of shadowing Kukoc and harassed the Croatian from the opening whistle. It was hard to run across the half court without a ball. And, and uh, with the ball, it was just, here, somebody else get it. <laughs> Tony definitely wasn't getting a shot up, and he wasn't going to score. Kukak is nothing for four, and he's contributed nothing. We wanted to go guard him on the bench. Come on, man. And the pressure continues. And after Pippen wore Kukoc down, it was Jordan's turn. Coach. Stolen by Jordan. He reads it better than anyone. Slammed up. Them dudes were all over. 
<laughs> yeah, I want MJ to tell me a story one day. I know dude is comedy. I had a question from my teammates during the game. Like, what is going on? What did, did, do you not see that they're really trying to uh, get you off the court? And I'm like, so what? I guess that's that's how NBA game is played. Pippen, Jordan, and the Americans cruise to another victory. This one by 38 points. But the domination had its detractors. This team of All-Stars is almost too good. Is it a positive or a negative? The question was now being That's one thing asked. I don't like about the media, boy. It's always something. Like, they can never take a W. You know, like, the media can never just give somebody flowers. In this instance, they can't just give the team their flowers and keep it moving. Then it's like, oh, is it too, like, should we go back to how it was with just the amateurs or should we keep allowing USA to do the pros because if we do the pros then we're just gonna it's gonna be a problem and woo, 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 woo. like it's just like you can't never just take a good you know a good solid thing that they did and keep it going was the dream team too great for its own good like dang this team of all-stars is almost too good. Some think that we should go back to the Look equations. It's been too easy. I think then we ought to ban the uh, African runners from the 10,000 meters because they make it look so easy as well. <laughs> uh, this is about our best, and this is wonderful for the sport of basketball. Irvin, uh, there's been some comments that the Dream Team is getting all the attention, and there seems to be some resentment about it. Have you heard about it, and do you have any feelings about it? Uh, basically, you know, we haven't heard about it. We're just here to do our job. The media I know that has to be annoying sometimes, though. Like, I can't even but walk down the street. And in the world beyond, the embrace of the Dream Team was universal. You had a Ruger stand out and root against Picasso? I mean, I mean, no, seriously. They rooted for genius at work. I kept thinking that the attention would dissipate. They're going to play the first game. They're going to win by 60. People are going to go back and watch Trek. <laughs> Team USA a 60 point lead. It didn't. It kept building and building and building. Because who don't want to watch that? Who don't want to go to a game like that? You feel me? Like, who don't want to... were trying to get autographs. Like, what? The security people like, you out your mind if you don't want to watch that. All the athletes were standing on side like a parade. Man. People perceived us as being superheroes. I want to know how y'all felt when y'all were seeing this. How did y'all feel, man? Like when y'all was watching this live, the guy on the or when you heard about it, what did you think? Pictures, and I said, "Wow, <laughs> we are having an effect over here." <laughs> he said, "Wow." Like for real, like what was y'all thoughts? Like, if you're not from America, I really want to know your thoughts. It was like. As if the president of the United States was uh, in the midst of a, a caravan that was going through the streets. It's crazy. It was like the Beatles, where there's thousands and thousands of people waiting all the time. That was the most exhilarating 15 seconds of my was, life. We're like, wow, this is amazing. No one member of the Dream Team reveled in the Olympic experience more than Charles Barkley. After throwing the controversial elbow against Angola, Barkley had emerged as the team's most visible player. Everybody always had the same question. How much of a, an ass is Charles Barkley? Hey, Jack, when am I going to be on the cover of Sports Illustrated for this stuff? I should be on the Dream Team cover. And then every time you'd go spend time with him, you know, you'd just realize that he was the most enjoyable act not only in all of sports, but possibly in all of pop culture. <laughs> Sometimes I dream that he is me. And I like Chuck, I mean Mike. Right away, I told my editors, I said, well, the number one angle here is what is Charles doing? And if you wanted the answer to that question, all you had to do was follow the crowds. They're like, we don't want you guys out and about because we don't know how safe it is. And I'm like, dude, I'm at the Olympics. I'm not going to stay in my room the whole time. <laughs> I understand, y'all. But you also got to understand, bro, for y'all to even walk to y'all bus, they are lined up for blocks, for miles to see y'all. And you trying to cruise the streets? 
Y'all seen how they was acting at the beach? Just to think, if you walk down the street, that's a, that's that's the hard part about being a celebrity, man. Because you gotta deal so with all of that. That's crazy. Man of the people, if ever there was that has one. to be so frustrating. Man, you just be I trying to live. Down the Rumbles every night, and the people were fantastic. They all wanted autographs and wanted to take pictures. We could be inside the hotel. Soon we heard the big roar. <sighs> we said. There go Charles. <laughs> <laughs> so Charles would be walking, and then thousands would be following him everywhere he went. You know, he was the Pied Piper. Charles would go over to the village and like find the Angolan players and hang out along the Ramblas at night. He was the most memorable person of the 1992 Olympics. I just saw for this real. That's crazy. Back. Who went on? I don't think anybody else in the world could have done it beside Charles Barkley. At the end of the day, he was America's best ambassador. I'm so glad nothing like that happened Barclay to him. Barkley was celebrated for experiencing the Olympics on his own terms. More quietly, one of his teammates found a way to do the same. We had the motorcycle escorts and we bust through traffic like Dick Tracy. But this one day, we got stuck in traffic and we're just sitting there and sitting there and sitting there. Finally, I said, that's it. Let's go. Anybody wants to go with me, I'm heading. He'd get off the bus, and his family met him. He started walking right through the middle of everybody. Where was that going? Noticed. I'm still on the bus, seeing him walk down the street, and I'm saying to myself, I would give anything to do what he just did. See, guys, this is called the Rhombus. See all the footprints? All right. That's cute. So Las Rambas, it's like Times Square or something. There's just so many people walking. I'm six feet one. I'm about the average size of everybody else on that little walk. So I'm walking with my family and I have the camera and nobody's noticing. I think it's and he took his glasses off? Yeah. Must be. Hi, you're from America. Yeah. Whereabouts? Uh, Whereabouts? Massachusetts. Massachusetts. You been watching the Dream Team at all? Yeah. They're pretty good, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> No attention whatsoever. That's Finally, love. ran across this lady who had the dream team and all the pictures on her T-shirt. Hi. Hi. Are you an American? Of course. You look wonderful. Why, thank you. She started speaking real excitedly about each of the players. And I said, have you had a chance to meet anyone? Yeah, I met yeah. Charles Barkley the other night. Did you? He's a hell of a player. I see you got all the players right there on your yeah. shirt. That's dope, Is Charles bro. the only one you've ever seen? No, I've never met. Hey, guys, do you know any of those guys on there? I think my oldest son, Houston, ruined the surprise. Yes, I did. That's your dad? Too bad he's not here. Uh, you play with I do, yeah. Bro, how you not notice John, bro? John's a legend. How you not notice not John? Like Michael Jordan walking through here. For the players, surreal experiences have become the norm. But even more memorable were the unlikely friendships developing behind the curtain. It was a unique mix. You know, Larry Bird and Patrick Ewing became like Carmelo along with her is weird. <laughs> I got a white guy from Indiana, and I got a brother from Jamaica. Patrick said I could pick his mind. It took me three minutes. <laughs> he said a white guy from Indiana and a brother from Jamaica. He's crazy. We would probably the two of the most unlikely people you thought that would be friends. But if you look... Not only Larry and I got to be great friends, but all of those guys got to be much better friends. We all enjoyed each other. We all enjoyed the ride. And we got a sense of each other as men. Then, when we got to the court, it made it even better. The Dream Team's chemistry turned out to be... Why I think regular team, like, why... Like, I feel like I heard this story a lot with the Olympians. Um, you know with the Kobe team and stuff, they did the same thing. But it's like, how come regular teams, as in like the regular season teams, can't do the same thing, create that bond? Like, create that bond in the summer or create that bond throughout the year. Have like special nights. Do do certain things to have that bond with your team so it can be easy on the court. Like, it just makes sense to do it that way, right? Hallmark of their success. As the players closed in on what they came for, Their big margins of victory may have been a testament to their dominance, but numbers couldn't capture 
what made watching them so unforgettable. I bet when you ask them about their careers, Guys played the best I bet they say, besides winning the championship, I bet they say this is probably like one of the most career, memorable poetry moments of their career. At times you feel you're For watching real. a performance, a concert, rather than a basketball competition. This was fun. This was like, it's how basketball supposed to be. Right. And at the center of the fun was the team's biggest star who had come to Barcelona at the peak of his powers and shown how much his popularity and just think if he wouldn't have went. I will say this one thing about Michael Jordan. I've been around other celebrities in my life. I've never seen people react like they do to him. People go crazy when they see him. Was someone who just wanted to see him. Please, Michael Jordan! No one had the sort of pull. Did they have security? The gravity that Michael Jordan had. Jordan had initially come to Barcelona reluctantly. But an early I think Jordan year, loved his lifestyle. Y'all think he did? Revealed how meaningful his like, Olympic experience had become. Like he knew he was good, but do y'all think he right truly now? loved what he did? Because that can be very Something exhausting. Like I'm drinking coffee. There's gotta be a hurry. Can we go now? Where are you from? Albuquerque. Albuquerque, New Mexico. Big fan of yours. That's a big fan of yours. <laughs> Your name? George Hirsch. George, how you doing? I'm doing Michael George, nice to meet you. Last night I hit the wall, man. Did you I couldn't make a basket. What right. are you doing up so early? I do remember getting up early <laughs> to walk into the stadium. That is the thing that I remember the most about the Olympics. Like I ever wonder if he Olympic was, stadium. you know, people imagine being big, but imagine as big as he was, I wonder if he us. ever like imagined that, like really truly be like, I'm gonna be this type of superstar one course. day. Or I wonder if he just got to that level and was just like, wow. Races. Like, or I wonder if he like, didn't even realize he was that Everybody big until like time went on. Then I was like, damn. I, I was really a superstar back day. then. It's crazy. The dream team squared off against Croatia again in the gold medal game, offering the world <clears> one more lasting impression of their supremacy. Who do y'all think that superstar is today? Like, who do you think that superstar is today? Where people are going absolutely insane for if, they, if he walked down the street or she. Who y'all think that superstar is? Including everybody. In any sport. Seventeen to eighty-five. Oh, a hundred and seventeen. I was like, what? There was never really any doubt the Dream Team would win gold in 1992. But as they walked back onto the court to get their medals, the moment still overwhelmed them. We saw a lot of cheers from players. It was a very proud moment for me because anytime you represent your country, you know, that's a prideful thing. Send chills down my spine. It was a reward that I had never felt like that I would ever achieve. To do it on that stage with those group of guys. It's a memory I'll never forget. Nothing in my life has ever felt like standing on that podium. I was getting goosebumps. Every single time I heard the national anthem after that had a different significance to me. I knew what it really meant. Mm. That's deep. As a young kid growing up, I used to watch Olympics on TV with my father, and uh, all he talked about was the Star Spangled Banner and the gold medal. It made him feel proud to be American. Being up on that podium that night and receiving it, my father, he'd been pretty proud. All those emotions just overcame me. 
I got to be one of the guys one more time for my country. I said, man, I'll never forget this moment. Hey. You know, if this is kind of sad. This is how I wanted to go out. Facts. This group may well be the greatest team ever assembled in the history of team sports. But when the medal ceremony was over, another realization began to settle in. When I walked off, I remember thinking that whole uh, dream has come to an end. The next season, every Olympian except Magic Johnson and Larry Bird would return to the NBA. Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen would win their third title. Are you serious? And the Phoenix Suns. That's crazy. You went to go win the Olympics and you barely have any recovery time before the season starts. And then you win the championship against the person who you was just on a team with? That's a wow, that's a wild story right there. On the way to six championships overall. The last three with Tony Kukoc. What a story. Eventually, other members of the team would also win titles. What a story. But each NBA player on the Dream Team would reach the Hall of Fame. Still, it's what they did together that summer that had the biggest impact on the game. An impact that continues to grow today. It really lifted basketball and it gave birth to international stars. Yeah, dude. Had nothing to do with those games in '92, but who took so much from it? Nah, that's that's facts. We made the game a worldwide game. Yeah. You know, I talked to Tony Parker. I talked to Ginobili. I talked to Dirk Nowitzki. Those guys say their first love of basketball started with the Dream Team, and I'm really proud of that. Yeah, I believe that. That's true. The world can change a lot in 20 years. But there are moments in time you never forget. No matter how long it's been. No matter how much else has changed in your life since. 20 years later, they've all kept ties to the game in one way or another. And they all talk about the summer of 92 as if it happened just yesterday. An experience still unlike any other in their remarkable basketball lives. I've never had more fun being around anybody. Everybody got along. There was no ego. We had fun. You know, clearly everybody reminds me I never won a championship. So that to me was like winning the championship, winning the gold medal and hanging out with these guys. The reward itself is really only a small part of the story. It's what the gold medal represents that will always tie these men together. This is like this fraternity. It's, that's pretty awesome. I don't think you're ever going to be able to get 11 Hall of Famers to play all at once, you know, um, on one team. That's, that's unheard of. <sighs> we go on the bus. <sighs> Come back. Ah. Walk out the hotel. Ah. Wave. Ah. <laughs> Wave outside your window. Ah. He's so <laughs> He's funny. It changed sport as we know it. They showed the world how to play basketball. What other team can say that? I don't think we'll ever see anything like it again. It's an insult to compare anybody else to that team. Mm. Take a good look. Perhaps we'll never see a team this great again. Hey. Well, folks. No team will ever have that happen. Hasn't had that happen. And uh, that's the dream team. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, 
don't know how I'm going to post this, but I hope you all will enjoy it. You're talking to me in the comment section. Let me know whatever thought that comes to your mind, whatever case may be. And any other videos you like to see me do, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, notification bell. With that being said, see you guys in the next video.